We are now moving on to the next phase in the management accounting syllabus, dealing with risk and uncertainty. We tend to use the terms risk and uncertainty interchangeably. In fact, they aren't quite the same thing. Risk is calculable. It deals with known possible outcomes and known or estimated probabilities. For example, there is a risk associated with tossing a coin. We don't know whether we're going to get a heads or a tails, but we know from experience it's going to be one of those two with a 0.5 or 50% probability of each. We can therefore build this risk into decision making. However, with uncertainty, we may not know the probabilities of the possible outcomes. We may not have the experience with which to estimate them. We may not even know all the possible outcomes themselves. It is this element of certain aspects being unknown that distinguishes risk from uncertainty. Often, one person's uncertainty is another person's risk, depending on the level of experience they each have of the situation. Let's consider Jack, the owner of a sandwich shop. He's owned and run his sandwich shop for many years, so he has experience as to what demand may be for his sandwiches from his off-the-street customers. Per day, demand could be 100 sandwiches with a probability of 0.2, 200 sandwiches with a probability of 0.5, or 300 sandwiches with a probability of 0.3. This is the risky variable Jack has to build into his plans. Jack sells sandwiches for $5 each and they have a variable cost of $2 associated with them. The owner of a local conference centre calls in to see Jack and offers him a contract to supply sandwiches every day. Jack is interested as he thinks that he has a total capacity to make up to 350 sandwiches a day in his shop and would welcome the chance to use up any spare capacity with a regular contract. To help the conference centre plan, Jack must sign a contract for the definite supply of a certain number of sandwiches for delivery each day. The options presented to him by the conference centre manager are to agree to a definite supply of 100, 150 or 200 sandwiches each day. The conference centre is only willing, however, to pay $3 a sandwich in view of their definite custom. Jack now faces a dilemma. His off-the-street customers earn him more profit. So if he agrees to supply, say, 200 sandwiches to the conference centre, he could easily be forced to turn more profitable business away. However, if he's only agreed to supply 100 sandwiches and demand from off-the-street customers is low, he might waste some of his capacity. Jack is trying to make a decision how many sandwiches to supply to the conference centre in the face of a risky variable being demand for sandwiches from off the street customers. Jack can build a payoff table to help him with this. It has the decision variable across the top, he has control over this, and the risky variable down the side. He doesn't have control over this. We then fill in the table. For example, if we're in this box, then John has agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and have 100 sales to off-the-street customers. A conference centre sandwich earns $3 less $2 is $1 per sandwich, whereas a sale to an off-the-street customer earns $5 less $2 is $3 per sandwich. This generates a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 100 times $3 is $400. Moving down to the next row, here we've agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and have 200 sales to off-the-street customers. This is still within Jack's capacity constraint of 350 sandwiches. This earns him a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 200 times $3 is $700. Moving down to the next row, here we've agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and we have demand for 300 sales to off the street customers. However, we have a capacity limit of 350 sandwiches per day 
so we can only supply 250 to off the street customers. We must supply 100 to the conference centre as we've signed an agreement to do so. This therefore earns us a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 250 times $3 is $850. Following the same process for the other two columns, we populate the payoff table. We'll be coming back to this table again and again in this part of the syllabus. How Jack uses this table will depend on his attitude to risk. Let's start off by assuming he is risk neutral. This means he makes his choices based on the balance of probabilities. He'll choose the option which, on average, will earn him the highest return. In other words, he will make his choice based on expected values. We need to now bring in probabilities. If Jack signs up to supply 100 sandwiches with the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 400 plus 0.5 times 700 plus 0.3 times 850 is $685. If Jack signs up to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 450 plus 0.5 times 750 plus 0.3 times 750 is $690. If Jack signs up to supply 200 sandwiches to the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 500 plus 0.5 times 650 plus 0.3 times 650 is $620. So, on average, Jack's contribution will be maximised if he signs up to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre. This conclusion needs careful thought though because it assumes Jack is risk neutral, it assumes the trial is repeated, you'll note that $690 is not an actual outcome but will be the average over repeated trials. It assumes Jack has accurately forecast the probabilities for this risky variable being off the street demand and it assumes that if we turn customers away without selling them a sandwich they'll try again another day and we haven't damaged goodwill. In other words, that the risky variable stays the same each time. In conclusion, when dealing with risk, we can undertake calculations based on the balance of probabilities if we are risk neutral. In our next video, we'll consider the need to build different attitudes to risk into our decisions.